Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And Jesus is that light of life. This is going to be part two of the life of John the Baptist. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 3. And we're going to, I guess we're going to read the whole chapter. Verse 1, in those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, a lot of people will try to confuse you by thinking that when we're told to repent means the same thing as when the Lord says he repents for repented. In the book of Jonah, God said that if he, he told Jonah to go to Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian Empire, and he said, yet 40 days and I will overthrow Nineveh. I'm going to destroy it. And Jonah came and was spit up on the beach, probably by a, a whale. Nineveh's deity, their god, was Dagon, which looks like uh, Disney's Little Mermaid. Yeah, from the waist up is a person, a human, and from the waist down is a fish. So when this fish spit up, Jonah out of its mouth surely the people thought wow this is <laughs> Dagon has sent a prophet to us you know can you imagine I mean fishermen on the on the oceans I mean uh in the Mediterranean seeing Jonah getting spit up by a fish or a whale or whatever it was and you know they probably followed him uh to Nineveh and probably said, this is a prophet of Dagon. And what did Jonah teach? Jonah taught the people to repent. And what did they do? They put off their soft, nice clothing. They put on sackcloth. They sat in ashes. They fasted and they prayed. Sackcloth and ashes. That's what America needs, but uh, I don't expect that's ever going to happen. But the book of Jonah records that God repented of his destruction of Nineveh. God turned, changed his mind. Well, God doesn't have sin to repent of. God says he's going to do something, and then he changes his mind. I mean, if Sodom and Gomorrah would have repented and sackcloth and ashes maybe he would have spared them but people want you to think repent when it talks about what the lord repents and what when we are told to repent they want you to think it means the same thing and it doesn't it absolutely doesn't there's a very famous internet preacher in tempe arizona that teaches Repent just means to change your mind about unbelief in God to believing in God. And that's all you got to do is re believe. Just believe on Jesus. Well, in James chapter 2, guess what? The devils believe in Jesus. Absolutely. When Jesus was casting out the devils, they said, I know who you are. Oh, yeah, they know. Absolutely, they know. In the book of Mark, chapter 1, verse 23, And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. <laughs> yeah, I wonder how many unclean spirits are in a synagogue. Hmm. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. He was possessed of a devil. Demon possession, right? And he cried out, saying, 
let us alone. Now, there obviously, there's more than one. The unclean spirit cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. These devils knew who Jesus was. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace. In other words, shut up and be quiet. Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. And immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. Oh, yeah. Now, does repent, when it's talking about humans, sinful humans, does it just mean to change our mind from unbelief to belief in God? Well, let's read the words of Jesus. And then we're going to go back, you know, we're going to get back to uh, reading in John, about uh, in Matthew 3. But in Revelation chapter 2, words of Christ in Read. This is Jesus speaking. Verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus. Now remember, Paul wrote a, a, an epistle, a letter, which we call the book of Ephesians. And that's what the people of Ephesus were. They were Ephesians. You know, people that live in New York City are called New Yorkers. People that live in Texas are called Texans. People that live in Florida, uh, Florida, are called Floridians. So, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor, and thy patience, and how that, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. And hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. Okay, you guys got a lot of good things going for you here, but I, uh, you got here's something you lack. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Hmm. Or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Two times in that sentence. Fallen, repent, do the first works, repent. Okay? But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Uh, but, 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 Chaplain Bob, I always heard God, God loves everybody and everything. Yeah, that's why rain down fire on uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Yeah. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. All right, verse 8, And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Now, you got to realize something. Jesus is the first and the last. Um, Jesus created everything of, um, on the physical realm. He created the angels too. 
So he was first, but he's also going to be the last. And Jesus in the flesh was dead and is alive. Revelation 2.9. Boy, I'm afraid to even say this verse the way they're uh, using speech recognition and AI and censorship. This is one of the verses that brought me to Christ, believe it or not. This is the verse that brought me to Christ. This is it. Sitting in a doctor's office. You could sit in a Baptist church for 20 years and never hear this verse preached. Never. Just sad. I know thy works. Whose works? The, the church of Smyrna. I know thy works and tribulation. They're trouble. And poverty. Well, they're poor in the flesh, but, but thou art rich. They're rich in the spirit. And I know the blasphem blasphemy. Blasphemy of them which say they are you know whose and are not but are the sin of Gog, of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Tell that to the pre-trib rapture people. <laughs> uh -uh. he that hath an ear let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches he that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death do you know there's two deaths you got physical death and then a spiritual death you don't want to be part of the spirit the spiritual second death bad news and to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. Pergamos, Satan's seat, his, his throne, his headquarters, Satan's seat. Talk about a rough neighborhood, dog. Let me tell you something. Where is Pergamos today? Uh, Turkey. Yeah. Yeah, the Muslims inherited Satan's seat. Well, they took it for a reason. That's some pretty rough stuff, huh? I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. It's funny, Satan dwells where modern day Islam is, right? 14. But I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Uh, Balaam was a false prophet. He, well, he was actually God's prophet. But he became a, a bad prophet because he loved the wages of sin. You can read about that in the book of Jude. Uh, Balak offered him uh, some money to curse Israel. He couldn't do it. But he told Balak how to uh, get God to be angry at Israel and to curse them. He taught them how to do that. And guess what? Nothing's changed in 2,000 years. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Oh, yeah. Balaam told Balak, oh yeah, get some good hot looking women and uh, make sure they're not wearing much clothes and send them into the camp. And uh, yeah, uh, I think everybody knows the rest of the story. And 
Lord got angry and let Israel be slain before their enemies. Has anything changed? Has anything changed in 2,000 years? Well, actually, uh, Balaam and all this, this was Old Testament. I think it's in the book of Kings. I'm not sure. I'd have to look it up. Uh, let me look it up real quick. You can read about Balaam in Numbers chapter 22, 23, 24. All right, so, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication? So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. And I'm not 100% sure what the Nicolaitans taught, but I, I've read some commentaries on it, but I, the, I don't think the Bible explains what it is. So, Lord is saying, sacrificed unto idols, fornication, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, <coughs> excuse me, which thing I hate. All right, so in verse 16, what does the Lord say? Repent. Repent of what? The fornication, eating things sacrificed to idols, uh, yeah, you know, and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. So the Lord wanted his people to repent. He said, repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Verse 18, And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God. Who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass? I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last is to be more than the first. Sounds like this is a pretty good church, huh? Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest, or allow, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my spirit, uh, my servants, seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Is she seducing them spiritually or in the bedroom? I don't know. Maybe both. And I don't know if you know it, Je there was a woman named Jezebel in the Old Testament who was married to King Ahab. And the Bible says that Ahab did more to provoke the Lord to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Ahab was bad news. But you know what? His wife Jezebel was worse. She was horrible. So, She's a false prophetess. She teaches and seduces Lord's servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her spent, uh, space. Now hear the Lord. I gave her space to repent of her unbelief. No. I gave her space to repent of her fornication. And she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their unbelief? No. Except they repent of their deeds. See, God doesn't have deeds that he needs to repent of. Sinful flesh, like us, repentance is 
very important. Turning away from the wickedness. So, behold, I will cast her into bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. Boy, that's some strong language. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end. Hmm. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a tickle feather. No. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. In Revelation 22, Jesus tells us he is the morning star. In the NIV, in the complete Jewish Bible, Messianic Bible, so-called, in Isaiah 14, speaking about what the King James calls Lucifer, they take the word Lucifer out of the Isaiah 14, and they insert the word morning star. So who fell from heaven? Not Lucifer. The morning star fell from heaven. Uh, boy, I'll tell you what. Those that think they're being funny by doing that stuff, uh, they're going to have sheer f horror on their face when they're looking down at the lake of fire and they're getting ready to, like in the uh, pirate movies, they're getting ready to walk the plank. Yeah. Arr. And I will give him the morning star. Sorry, Jesus is the morning star, not Lucifer. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, how can a believing church repent of their unbelief? No, no. They've got to repent of their deeds, their works. That's what repentance means when it's talking about us. God doesn't have to repent of his wickedness. Uh, you know, it just, it makes me crazy, these people. That's why the Bible said to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And dispensational theology with seven dispensations is not rightly dividing the word of truth. Matter of fact, they think the Antichrists are, are the chosen ones. And if you don't know what an Antichrist is, uh, may I suggest you read 1 John, the book of 1 John. Uh, you got the, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then you got 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, which is towards the end of the Bible, just before the book of Jude and Revelation. So... Yeah, John will tell you what the definition of an Antichrist is. Matthew 3, verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah. That's the Greek rendering for Isaiah saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. Where is that? Well, that's in Isaiah chapter 40. 
You know, of the uh, all the years I went to Bible college, the the class that I liked the most was the book uh, was the class on Isaiah. I learned a lot about Isaiah from that class. So let's read Isaiah chapter 40. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem. Where was uh, John the Baptist? Judea. And cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. How do we pardon iniquity? Christ. For she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. Something you should know. The book of Isaiah is compared to a mini-Bible. The Bible has 66 books. Well, the King James. The, the so-called Protestant Bible has 66 books. The, the Vatican Bible has more than that. I think it's 73. I don't remember. It's immaterial. I don't think um, the Apocrypha belongs in the Bible, but that's just my opinion. But guess what? The Old Testament has 39 books. The Old Testament has 39 books. Guess what the 40th book in the, in the Bible is? It's in the New Testament, Matthew. Matthew is the first gospel of the, New, uh, of the New Testament. It's the 40th book in the Bible. What are we reading here? Isaiah chapter 40. In Isaiah, chapters 1 through 39 is judgment. I mean, Lord is angry with Israel. Bad. But here, in Isaiah 40, it roughly corresponds to the Gospels, the New Testament. Let's, let's go back to Isaiah chapter 40 and, and, and go back to verse 1. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. How are we supposed to have comfort? Comfort in Christ. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem. And cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. For she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. And how is her iniquity pardoned? Christ. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. I mean, there are Bible teachers that will tell you that there's two Isaiahs. Because the first 39 chapters are totally different from verse chapter 40 to verse six, uh, chapter 66. Seriously, this Isaiah is, in a lot of ways, is like, it mimics the Bible, the whole thing. This reads like the New Testament. Verse 5, And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. The voice said, Cry, and he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass. And all the goodly, good, goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. You know, grass is here today and tomorrow it's gone. 
People are like grass to the Lord. Verse 8. The grass withereth, the flower, flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Unless, of course, you listen to Dr. James White, and he'll tell you, well, you know, we, we don't, uh, well, the King James Bible is wrong, but we know, all the, we know all the problems with it, and we can correct them. Uh, yeah, yeah, you ask somebody like Dr. James White, uh, what what is a perfect Bible? And he doesn't have an answer. Well, you know, all Bibles have errors in them. Well, you know, I, I'm going to believe my Bible. The grass withereth, the flower, flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. O Zion, that bring us good tidings. What were the good tidings? Christ. Get thee up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem, that bring us good tidings. Lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Wow. Behold your God. And by the way, people, I got an entire playlist on Isaiah. An entire playlist where I do a commentary on all 66 books. Behold your God. Who was, who was God that came to Jerusalem? Christ. 1 Timothy 3.16, God was manifest in the flesh. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And I might have paraphrased that a little bit, but you get the idea. Jesus was God in the flesh, was, is, and always shall be. O Jerusalem, that bringest good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength, lift it up, be not afraid, say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. Christ is coming with his reward. Verse 11. He shall feed his flock. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. Didn't Jesus say he was a good shepherd? Absolutely. He shall gather the lambs with his arms and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. Hmm. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and meted out heaven with the span, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance? And this ties in with Job 38. When God asked Job, Hey, uh, where were you when I made the earth? Huh? Uh, can you tell me? Of course, Job doesn't have an answer because the, he wasn't around yet. Verse 13, who hath directed the spirit of the Lord? Did anybody tell the Lord how to, you know, were they, you know, uh, when you got a movie, you're making a movie, you got a guy that's called the director. He's the one that says, well, I don't like that scene I want you to put more emphasis on, you know, your your speech or whatever, or, you know, I, I just don't like that. You know, the director runs the show on the movie set. But here in verse 13, the Lord asks, who hath directed the spirit of the Lord? Uh, who, who, who was in charge of the spirit of the Lord? Or being his counselor hath taught him. Did any of us give counsel to the Lord? Uh, the answer is no, absolutely not. With whom took he counsel? And who instructed him? And taught him the path of judgment? And taught him knowledge and showed him and showed to him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket. Ah, you 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 wonder where that expression came from? 
You know, there's a bunch of expressions that come from the Bible. A little birdie told me, the skin of your teeth, uh, a drop in the bucket. <laughs> you know, it's amazing how much of the Bible used to permeate our culture. But that was long ago. Now people are, uh, yeah, never mind. Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as a small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the beast thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him less than nothing and vanity. To whom then will ye liken God? Or what likeness will ye compare unto him? The workman melteth a graven image, and the goldsmith spreadeth it over with gold, and casteth silver chains. He that is so impoverished that he hath no oblation, chooseth a tree that will not rot. He seeketh unto him a cunning workman to prepare a graven image that shall not be moved. Let your little secret about idols. Idols don't see, they don't hear, and they don't move. Verse 21. Have ye not known? Have ye not heard? Hath it not been told you from the beginning? Have ye not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. Huh, the circle of the earth, the circle of the earth. Uh, if flat earth is true, then we're, we're, you know, the earth is like a pancake. But I won't argue flat earth. I won't argue round earth. It's stupid to argue. I think we ought to argue over what kind of stones to use to stone uh the people that the Bible says to stone. I vote granite. But, yeah. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in, that bringeth the princes to nothing, he maketh the judges of the earth as vanity. Yea, they shall not be planted, yea, they shall not be sown, yea, their stock shall not take root in the earth. And he shall also blow upon them, and they shall wither, and the whirlwind, and the whirlwind shall take them away as stubble. What's a whirlwind? Tornadoes, twisters, hurricanes, cyclones, yeah, typhoons. To whom then will ye liken me? Or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, on high, and behold, who hath created these things that bringeth out their host by number? He calleth them all by names. The host of heaven people is the angels. That bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by names by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one falleth. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speaketh, O Israel? My way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God. Um, are, are our wicked ways hidden from the Lord? I don't think so. I don't think so. My way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God. Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard? That the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. God doesn't get tired. You know, when God rested on the seventh day, uh, when he created the heavens and the earth, he wasn't resting because he was tired. He took a day of rest to reflect upon everything that he had made as an example unto us to give us a day of rest to reflect upon the things of the Lord. 
and to give our flesh body rest. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth, the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord... But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. I got an entire playlist on eagles. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Isaiah chapter 40, the end. All right, let's go to back to Matthew 3 John the Baptist and no it's not John the Southern Baptist sadly the Southern Baptists are riddled with Freemasonry absolutely riddled with it Billy Goat Graham was a, a Freemason and that was his his uh, demon nomination uh, the Southern Baptists all right, let's go to Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he, Christ. This is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, the Greek rendering of Isaiah. <clears throat> saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment. What's raiment? It's clothing. It's one of those old English words of clothing. Had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins. And his meat, his food, was locusts and wild honey. Can you imagine a guy showing up at a Baptist church wearing camel's hair clothing and eating locusts? They'd be calling the little men in white coats to come and get this guy and lock him away in a rubber room. Then went out to meet, uh, went out to him, Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan. And were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. God has a lot to say about confessing our sins. Oh, yeah. Now, what is baptism? Well, obviously, you know, you uh, they were being dunked in the River Jordan. But what does that symbolize? Uh, the washing of the water of the flesh. It's symbolic. And if there's, I think it's the Church of Christ. Uh, they call them Campbellites. Uh, they'll tell you that water baptism is a requirement for salvation. And did the thief on the cross get baptized in water? No. He didn't. He absolutely did not. So, getting the flesh wet, I mean, you know, it's like taking a bath, right? Um, but what's more important? Washing the outward man or the inward man? Well, I think Paul makes a good point in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 24. Ephesians 5.24 Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Do you know that husbands are supposed to love their wives as much as Christ loved the church? Christ gave his life 
for his church. And so should a husband do that for his wife, if the need arises. So, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it. Christ wants to sanctify and cleanse the church. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water, washing of water by the word. Yeah, we're not talking about getting your body wet. God wants us to sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And boy, that's not me. <laughs> holy and without blemish, that's definitely not me. So John's preparing the way for the Lord. He's preparing it. He's getting people in the right mindset. But it's not there yet. Uh, let's see, verse 6. And were baptized of him, John, in Jordan, confessing their sins. Why, what do you mean, confessing sins? Well, in the book of James, chapter 5 and verse 16, it says, Confess your faults one to another. Boy, if I did that, you'd, uh, if I did that online, there, you'd be listening to me for hours. Confess your faults, you know, our sins, one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, now there's a big difference between confessing your sins and bragging about them. You know, you... When you go to the confession booth in a Catholic church and you're confessing to the priest, hey, uh, priest, uh, yeah, you know, my neighbor's hot wife, yeah, her husband went away on a business trip for two weeks and I, you know, yeah, you know, or uh, yeah, my business partner, I cheated him out of a lot of money when he went on vacation. You know, that's not confessing your sins. That's bragging. You know, confessing your sins is being sorrowful, repenting, turning away from them. Straighten up and fly right. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he, he who, Christ, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us, the washing of the water of the word, right? And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Right? Yeah. Listen to this. This is Old Testament. Nehemiah 1 and verse 6. Uh, if I remember correctly, Nehemiah was the king of Judah when Persia allowed Israel to return to Jerusalem after the end of the Babylonian captivity, uh, Ezra was the priest. If I, I might have Nehemiah and Ezra mixed up, but I think Ezra was the priest and Nehemiah was the king. Nehemiah 1.6 Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins, confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house have sinned. Mm. All right, Matthew 3, verse 5. Then went out to him, Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan 
and were baptized of him, John, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw, but when who, John, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, many, not all, many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, Oh, you bunch of chosen people, how are you doing? Uh, no, that's not what he said. He said, Oh, generation of vipers. What's a viper? A viper is a very venomous type of snake, serpent. You ever heard of a pit viper? Yeah, bad. You don't want to be anywhere around vipers. O oh, generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. What do you mean bringing forth fruits, meat for repentance? What, go to an apple tree and start picking some good apples? No. Fruit. Their works. Repent of your wickedness and start doing good things. Verse 9. And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also, the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. What do you mean good fruit? You, you, got, you want sweet apples? Is that? No. Our works. We got to have good works. You know, good works are proof that we're grafted into the tree. Christ. Good works are proof. But if you don't have any good works, well, it's possible you're going to be chopped down and burned alive, cast into the fire. Verse 11. Here, listen to this carefully. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I. Who's going to come after him? Christ. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Yes, even believers are going to be baptized with fire. This world is going to be burned up. We don't need just, you, you know, baptism of water is okay. But being baptized with the Holy Ghost is even more important. And the Pentecostals will take this to such an extreme that if you're not slithering on the floor, spouting gibberish, you're not saved. Uh, it makes you wonder. Jesus is going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand. Why? Have you ever heard of fanning the fire? And he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat, his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Yeah. You know, when you harvest wheat, you separate the wheat berries from the the rest of the plant that you can't eat and you burn it up. When Christ comes, he's going to gather the wheat into his barn, but everything else is going to be burned up. Verse 13, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? John's like, you're coming to me to be baptized? Lord, I need to be baptized from you. 15. And Jesus answering said unto him, 
suffer or allow suffer it to be so now for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness then he suffered him and Jesus when he was baptized in the water went up straightway out of the water and lo the heavens were opened unto him and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him and lo a voice from heaven saying this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Can you imagine all the people that were following John the Baptist? People that were getting baptized of him. Can you imagine this? John baptizes Jesus. He comes out of the water. The heavens open up. The Spirit of God descends like a dove in the sight of everybody. And then it was lighting upon Jesus. And then a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And then this is the start of when Jesus started his ministry. So I think this is going to be pretty close. Well, you know, I got one more thing I need to cover. Uh, think about the uh, new and then the world and then the order, you know, the, uh, you know, the people that are uh, trying to set up, you know, a one world government. Go to Psalms chapter two. Verse one, why do the heathen rage? Yeah, the heathen rage. And the people imagine a vain thing. What is vain? Means worthless. And the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves and their rulers take counsel together against the Lord. Has anything changed? The kings of the earth and the rulers, they conspire together against the Lord and against his anointed God. They're against God and God's people saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. See, God's word is holy. His, his laws are binding, but they don't want it. Thou shalt not kill. Oh, we don't want, we don't want to listen to that. But, hey, I don't like this guy. I'm going to kill him. You know, that's, that's what they did with Christ. They didn't like Jesus. So they killed him. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. Do you know God's going to laugh at them? The Lord shall have them in derision. What is derision? It means like insan insanity, craziness. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Oh yeah, God's going to speak to them in his wrath and the Lord's going to vex them. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Verse 7, I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Yes, God has a son. Uh, Islam, their God doesn't have a son. But my God has a son. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. There's only one only begotten son, and that's Christ. Verse 8, Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen, for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. You know, that sounds exactly like when the nations of the West colonized the world. God gave us the heathen for an inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. 
and they hate us for that. You know, the, West, the Western world is doing exactly what God said Israel would do, and yet they hate us for it. Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth, Serve the Lord, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son. You better kiss Christ, the Son of God, and not like Judas did. Betrayest thou me with a kiss, Judas? Judas, betrayest thou me with a kiss? Oh, yeah. Verse 12, kiss the Son lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Do you know that those that put their trust in Christ are blessed? Blessed? Oh, yeah. All right, well, this is the end of part two. And... Uh, I guess there's going to be a part three, because we're not even close to being done. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen.